Hello, welcome to Lucy's Big Beautiful World of Painting. I am here today for part two of our two-part series with Master Todd Casey. Now, Master Todd Casey is primarily an oil painter. However, I took a, a wonderful class with him over at the Art Students League in New York City. And um, I was so impressed with him. I asked him to come on my show to show us beginners how we can approach um, painting with acrylics in an oil painting fashion using uh, deco art products and their mediums and he um, was so kind to come today from Westchester New York and uh, he teaches in the tri-state area and before I forget I do want to mention his book again the art of still life which is available on Amazon he's going to talk a little bit about that in today's show first what I'm going to have him do is recap a little of what he did on the first show he did a, a grassai painting and underpainting and I'm going to just go right to him and have him um, start start working and start teaching us. So, Todd, again, thank you for being here for part two sure. of the show today. Thanks for having me back. You're uh, welcome. Honored to be here. Uh, so in the first, first show, what we talked about was um, a very indirect way of painting. Uh, ties back to the old masters, the Renaissance painters, and uh, all the way taken up through the French academics uh, like Bouguereau and Jean-Léon Jerome. Uh, those are an extension of where I got my training from. So it was kind of a lineage passed down. Uh, one of the things that they would do would, would be a monochromatic underpainting uh, called a grisaille. And what that just means is to take and set up your value structure so you can use it as a guide for the next, um, the next layer of paint, kind of the finish layer. That's what I did on the first show. Today I'm going to do the color. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to use all this as my guide to how I apply, how I apply paint over the top. Um, to avoid pitfalls, one of the things I want to do is to think about the uh, and articulate the light source. The reason why I, I talked about the highlight briefly last time, the highlight um, has to do with me, the the artist in relation or the observer in relation to the sphere in relation to the light. The form and the lightest part of the form has to do with the light most facing plane, meaning that if I were to take and uh, put this paintbrush into the sphere when the cast shadow would fall in on itself, similar to like a sundial at high noon or when the sun's over the top. When there's no cast shadow in on it, that means or no cast shadow because it falls in on itself. That means that the it is facing the light. So that would mean, I'll just do a quick little diagram on the top. Uh, if I had a sphere, uh, and I show the geometry, it would be something like right there, the light most facing plane. The highlight is sitting on a different geometry. Again, that has to do with me to the uh, object to the light source. Okay, and the way you're viewing it from where you're sitting, somebody sitting someplace else may view it. Right, in if a you were to peek spot. around, you would right. see it, it meets you over here. Okay. That's why uh, you'd be chasing the highlight. Mm -hmm. rather than painting to the lightest part. I just would like to say you're, today you're using the um, Deco Art Traditions brushes and right now you're using a small round brush and I know that you have a, a number 12 flat and a filbert in case you need them. Yeah. Right now um, he's, uh, Todd is just starting with the, uh, the round brush. He's mm -hmm. going to use a variety of blues, um, uh, probably cobalt and uh, you have a cobalt yeah. out and a ultramarine. Um, the um, the canvas, it's not the canvas, he's using a panel. Todd, show us your um, sure. your panel there from uh, Trekhel Company. So this is a, uh, a the, you want to work on a harder surface. Uh, even if you have linen on, you would want to glue it onto a panel. Over time we found out that uh, linen expands and contracts do with the moisture in the air. Mm -hmm. Something like a panel, wood still does expand and contract a little bit, a but masonite, less. Masonite, hardwood, but this right. Trekel is a very, very nice yeah, panel. Yeah, these are great. Trekel sells them. Um, mm -hmm. This is Baltic birch, which is a oh. nice hardwood. Baltic birch. Yep. You can also go to Home Depot and get, you know, uh, masonite nice. and cut it down yourself. Now at the end of the show we'll have Todd's information, his uh, social media, um, and also he'll have some information about uh, Trekel and where you can get a coupon code to buy uh, their wonderful products. Right. So we have cerulean blue here. I have cobalt blue here. This is ultramarine blue, phthalo blue, and then carbon black. Mm -hmm. This is titanium white. If you squint down, uh, typically we can see our values a little b uh, better. Mm -hmm. It actually makes it so that um, you can accurately, accurately see 
values a little better. Mm -hmm. Sometimes high chroma colors or saturated colors tend to be a little difficult to see what the actual value is. So what do you mean by high chroma? You mean the, the pigment saturated. amount, how, how much color is in it? Right, so earthy colors are, tend to be a, a little bit, you know, like my blue is uh, not as chromatic as a dark blue like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a way to judge how much saturation is in a color. Um, I, I use a, probably the Munsell system, which is hue value chroma, meaning what's the color of the uh, of the and the Munsell object. system is a system that um, anybody can look up to, yeah. to learn about. It's the three dimensions of color. Hue, mm -hmm. value, meaning the lightness and darkness of it. The chroma, which means how saturated or desaturated it is. Mm -hmm. A color is desaturated when it's monochromatic like this. And then there would be a level of saturation. Okay. So it's, it's more of a, a sphere than a two-dimensional wheel. Mm -hmm. um, so what I want to do is kind of associate this to value and I know that blue is pretty much, you know, a pretty dark color. Uh, probably somewhere in the middle of the uh, value range. And I'm going to put just, this would be the light most facing plane here. This is, as I said here, it, it's facing up towards the light. The highlight is not. Mm -hmm. And then if I look at, the light's going to fall off. This is called the inverse square law. So as light travels away, especially on a sphere, those light particles can't, uh, they're not hitting all of this, and then eventually the terminator is light can't hit that part of the surface, and then shadow begins. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, what I'll do is just take and kind of associate these to, to values. So thalo blue is a nice dark blue, mm -hmm. and if I put that here, uh, I could see that I could match it. If I squint down, match it to what I have there, and I could connect these two. So you're using your underpainting. Um to help you now with your values, right. uh, with but using your, your color. Yeah, so what I can do is take these two colors, and then if I were to mix the two of them uh, together, I would I could get it, I need to put a transition of values mm -hmm. uh, in between these that would go from light to dark. And that's how I'm going to approach uh, what form is. And, and this is really where the kind of magic, uh, you know, to get something to feel like it comes up off the page, it has to get lighter uh, mm -hmm. in relation to the, you have to put the transition of lights and darks in the right spot to uh, describe the form. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm gonna just put this on quickly because I need to find the range. Mm -hmm. But um, really this is, I try to reserve by not using too much white, um, but I'm gonna push the, the values a touch lighter. To, to heighten the effect of, um, and you can see it's really just a value scale that mm -hmm, I put over it. Mm -hmm. I see it's getting darker and is a mid-tone and then it's getting lighter yeah. as we're going up. The most important thing is to not roll, uh, roll my transition of light and dark to the highlight. If, that, if I did it there, this would start to get darker away from it and it, it can't because it won't feel like that what I see. Okay, so that I'm not I'm not sure I understand. So if you're going darker, mid-tone, lighter, but it does look like you're going towards your highlight. Right. I'm actually going through the highlight. You're going the highlight through the highlight and continuation of it. I'm rolling to the light most facing plane, which is right there. Uh -huh. And then the highlight is, as we said, the angle of incidence. It has to do with uh, a geometry of meeting me in between the fullest part of the form. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of going through, in other words, you're kind of pretending yeah. that it's going through. Yeah, if this through, gets in the way, it. render it last. Find the light most facing plane. Okay. So for my, um, for my followers and all, uh, of course, this is more advanced than what you're used to seeing on my show. So what I would suggest you do is, um, besides going to Amazon and buying, and buying Todd's um, book, um, again, I'm going to say that The Art of Still Life, this way um, you can follow from the beginning, okay? Um, also, of course, look the words up. Uh, the words, um, the, what Todd is trying to explain today, um, there's more of detailed explanations. Of course, we don't have the time for him to go into a lot of detailed explanations. So that you can, you can look up and um, that will help, okay? And of course, watch the show over again so you can, you can follow along. So while I'm talking now, he's really putting some paint on there. Yeah, um, I'm gonna go quick here. To, to try to show more of the form so everybody can kind of see where he's trying to get at. Yeah, and, and, and really what I wanna do is just make sure that as I'm bending these values over this 
uh, over this sphere. Um, I'm, I'm just putting them in the correct order, uh, bending towards the light and not towards the highlight. But each brush stroke is lighter or darker than the one I see before it. It's, it's a way of, uh, we call it getting on the form. And uh, it, it really, it's very similar to music, where if you do value or skills, you're going either um, higher or lower. Mm -hmm. And essentially, I feel like I'm playing an instrument just, you know, rendering from light or uh, from light to dark or from dark to light. Right now, I've kind of established just quickly where the light most facing plane is, so I know that every piece of form, I don't always get it correct, is going to be uh, lighter or darker than that. So again, the... So you're not necessarily, if I'm correct, going from um, the value scale, like um, dark, a little lighter, a little lighter, a little lighter, all the way up. Sometimes you're putting a mid-tone in between more to separate the, the coloring. Everything should be lighter or darker. To get Next on, to each other. Yeah, well, to get on the form, I want to think, is this piece of value lighter or darker than the last one? Because it orients where the light source is. Mm -hmm. If I don't and I start to jump around and to put values in, in different places, it's getting off the form. It's kind of copying optically what I see in front of me rather than understanding uh, that light um, kind of falls on this form. Right. It's, it's an understanding of the light. And so it is better than to kind of follow darks up to the, leading up to the light. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I don't want to jump around. Because right. if I jump around, I know that, um, you know, and if I add more time, I'd show you a bunch of uh, optical kind of illusions in which mm -hmm. the simultaneous contrast is one of them. Joseph, uh, I believe, not Joseph Albers, the, the Gestalt psychology, mm -hmm. they talk about them, where it's just, if we had the same value sitting in between a light and a dark, you wouldn't be able to know that the eye just, the, the eye can't transmit the information to the brain, and we constantly are just, um, we think one's darker than the other one. Mm -hmm. So to get on the form, I'm really having this sculptural sense of how do I uh, make everything, because the 3D illusion that I'm getting is that this is coming up off the page, right? Mm -hmm. And that's really what I want to, um, just the illusion I'm going for. So this is a flat panel, I'm trying to make it look 3D. Exactly, yeah. And start with the flat panel. You know, and you may not get it right. I recommend to get on the form and then uh, roll your transitions of light to dark. Mm -hmm. uh, acrylic, you know, different properties than oil. Yeah. Oil, I, I wouldn't so much go back and and render uh, what I'm doing right now, kind of work back into layers. But um, the goods and the bads of this is that uh, it dries really quick. Mm -hmm. So I can uh, alter it. And do you find the medium helps you sometimes then to extend it? To yeah, extend it gets the a little, drying time? Yeah, it gets a little thicker. Because I noticed once in a while you were using the um, extender medium. Yep. Oh, so that reminds me. Um, uh, Todd uh, used the uh, DecoArt Chalky Gesso as his um, primer for the um, panel, okay? So this is a really nice product to use underneath. And um, when he first did his Grisai, he used the Decoar Premium in Burnt Umber. And um, you did add a little bit of white in there too and a little bit of black, all right? When Todd is finished, he will be um, coating his, um, his painting with the DuraClear gloss varnish okay so this is a nice varnish that will protect it and it'll be very protected after that and I think I did mention about the brushes he's using so these are all products you can just look up or go to your local craft stores home um, let's see uh, you know Joann's and Michael's and all those and, and you know can can buy any of the products there mm -hmm. okay. yeah, acrylic is a good kind of segue mm -hmm. into oil it's uh, less toxic oil has a uh, uh, you definitely want ventilation if you're going to work in oil. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing with acrylic is that they're polymers, I believe. So you're kind of painting with liquid plastic. Mm -hmm. like, the, like a plastic. <laughs> it yeah. dries hard and it's, it's stable for life, that's for sure. Yeah, and the other good thing is that you don't need solvents. Um, oil paint, typically you'll use a solvent or mm -hmm. mineral spirits. Right. Even if it's odorless, it's still kind of... Uh, not good for you. It's uh, and these just wash up with water, and you could always, yep. um, you know, it's better to, to um, you know, be gentle with your brushes and and never let the um, paint dry in the brush. That's very important. 
Yes, correct. There are while, ways to get away oh, you I'm sorry. Know, around that. But. <laughs> yep. Um, while you're painting, I just want to, um, I just would like to show again, I know I, sh I showed on the last, on the last show, um, Todd's beautiful painting available at the Ray's Contemporary Gallery in New York City. And this is named um, Shackleton. It's an 18 by 24. Todd teaches in the uh, tri-state area. He's from Westchester, New York. Yeah, I, I actually paint, uh, I'm from Massachusetts originally, but I teach all throughout the Northeast. Mm -hmm. I have a passion for teaching. It took me a while to kind of find this, and I just, you know, if, if I can help someone get to where they need to be a little quicker uh, than it took me, I, you know, we talked about my journey on the first mm -hmm. show. Yes. Um, I, there's so much joy in painting. People do it for many different reasons, and it's, uh, it's something that you can just do leisurely in the comforts of your own home or in classes or whatever way, but um, I just love it. So. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about the process of becoming a master painter. Uh, a lot of time. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers, mm -hmm. and uh, he talks about the 10,000 hour rule. I believe oh. something like that would be uh, comparable. I think that, you The 10,000 hour rule? 10,000 hours, yeah, of intense training. Oh. And it's just, uh, you're, there's, no, there's no shortcut to uh, mastery. And I think, you know, I think that's what we're always looking for. Mm -hmm. But um, just like a musical instrument, you're not going to, unless you hit like auto-tune, you're not going to learn how to play the instrument. You know, it, it takes, uh, I'm trying that. There's no, <laughs> there's no quick button. I right. play classical guitar and I'm terrible at it. Oh. But, um, you know, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses, and I feel um, just if, if you have a passion for this, do it, and, uh, and try to put focused time into uh, when you're painting. And if you can, uh, get a room with a door so you can kind of block out the world and mm -hmm. just stay focused. A dedicated focused. area yeah, for I yourself. Highly mm -hmm. recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, my wife has been extremely uh, supportive and you know back in the day when I was in my schooling we would um, I would paint in my living room and she would be totally okay <laughs> with it but you know not it's a luxury to have a, a studio a room sure yeah. so do what you can if you need to take a class mm -hmm. uh, whatever way to you know get focused I, I don't work well uh, in groups because I chat <laughs> and, uh, That's what makes you a great teacher. Well, explaining and, and chatting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, whatever, whatever way you want to um, just get painting. There's a lot of joy in it. I recommend everyone try it. Let me just take a peek at this. This is the um, Todd opened the uh, a little jar of the heavy gel medium. Okay, the deco art heavy gel medium. And the blue colors are just beautiful colors. So you're using uh, three different blue colors. You yeah. are using them all, right? Not really. I'm are actually using the two. Yeah, I'll usually put up. This is called analogous colors, mm -hmm. and it just means the families uh, of colors. So cerulean blue, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, and thalo blue are all kind of relative. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all cousins. Now I didn't notice if you if you're using the two those two blues so you're really just using these two but you did use a little bit of the ultramarine. Cobalt right? blue and phthalo is what I'm using right okay, now. Okay cobalt and phthalo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, because acrylic dries so fast and uh, it's a little more transparent than I usually what I would do in uh, oil mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm having to put down a couple layers. A couple of layers of paint right. Yeah. So to darken a color, sometimes uh, rather than add black to it, you're actually just using another layer of paint on top of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's actually one of the beautiful things about acrylic is that um, you, you kind of work really fast. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, oil dries. It actually doesn't dry. It oxidizes. Mm -hmm. It changes uh, st stage into uh, film, dries mm -hmm. as a film. Um, so it really, you know, you can see now that this is lighter than that. Yes. Um, but I can knock down that highlight a little bit too. Mm -hmm. I, again, the beauty of working in acrylic is just knock it down a little bit, and then I can add thickness to it to build it back up. Mm -hmm. You know, it depends what the surface of the material. You know, that's also the good thing. You don't <laughs> want to do that with fingers. oil. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But. Um, 
I can knock it down uh, depending on the surface and how um, how clear the reflection is mm -hmm. uh, or the highlight which is really just light particles bouncing off the surface mm -hmm. it describes what the what the surface is and Todd is using a butcher's tray and he wet a um, paper towel and laid his paints on the paper towel to keep it damp on one side and the other side he has a dry paper towel so yeah. he can use that and he's holding a paper towel and wiping his brush as needed so you can see that this is feeling three-dimensional but what I didn't do is I didn't render much in my shadows because shadows have to be rendered carefully and if I go too light it's gonna jump out mm -hmm. but at the end it was described to me from one of my teachers that shadows should be light and airy meaning that they should be more of a whisper oh. than uh, kind of jumping out at you Mm -hmm. um, when we look at shadows, we can focus in and see that there's light in there. I think automatically kind of the brain says, light, 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 look at the light. So then how, how, how are you going about, instead of just painting the shadow pitch black, uh -huh. I, I noticed you're, you're putting a little blue in there now. Is that how you're making it look more uh, atmospheric, so to say? Yeah. I mean, what's happening is the light particles are bouncing down off of the surface. We used a black uh, back board here, mm -hmm. foam core so that the light particles actually, you know, it's the reason why um, in sunlight w you wear white outside because mm -hmm. the light absorbs into the material. For black, they will... Mm -hmm. uh, you'll be warmer. Yeah, uh -huh. you'll be warmer. Yeah. So, same sense, the light particles are, are being absorbed into this more than they would on a white wall mm -hmm. where they would bounce off you, which is why you want to wear a white shirt to right. bounce all the heat right. off of you in the summer. Mm -hmm. So instead, um, they absorb into it so the light is not reflecting into the shadows and they tone them down. If I were to take that out and put a white background, you'd see this like, you wouldn't be able to see the light in the shadow. Mm. So importantly, I'd say one thing you want to do in, your, in the comfort of your own home is find a scenario where you can control the light. I think it's super important. Mm -hmm. But what I want to do is just slowly kind of step into what the value of that shadow is. So you're kind of actually toning down the shadow. Yeah, I'm actually lightening it, but I'm using the shadow to guide me. Because mm -hmm. just like in relation to these two values, that's lighter than that. Yes. And that's really where the tone of the, the shadows are. But instead, my eye, my brain actually says, oh, light. And I go white. And that's mm -hmm. consistently, it has to be this tiny range. Instead mm -hmm. of, um, you know, jumping quickly uh, to something, uh, it's it's really more of a small step. It's just that it, almost like what happens with our eyes is we have cones and we have rods, right? And in the middle of the night, uh, if you get up to go get something from the refrigerator, you'll notice that, you know, you don't see anything at first and then all of a sudden the uh, the uh, rods in your eyes are starting to work. They're the light and darkness. Usually right, like they... taking time to adjust. Right, and then what happens when we look in the shadows is we just see a lot more than we think is actually there. It's actually a lot darker than what we think. And we notice it as dark, but it's really just a step back. Mm -hmm. This is that Joseph Albers kind of uh, color is always relative to what it's next to. And, and it's going to appear differently. But I think right away we kind of think opposites. So I think dark, dark light, light, <laughs> and then I think white, black, but it's really, uh, that could be light considered next to that. Mm -hmm. And really where good, good masterful painting in is in subtlety of values, not in big, you know, light, everything is light. Right, I, I, so if you don't, if you want to lighten something, you don't necessarily just go to the white. It's only light in relation to it. Right. It's just, uh, that's lighter than that, so. Instead of jumping, try to tiptoe, mm -hmm. uh, slowly move towards something. You can see now the, the reflected light is starting to feel a bit more uh, closer to probably what it is. I think it could still get a little lighter, but um, mm -hmm. I, I really just slowly move into what that, what that value is, rather than just jump into uh, white. So um, as you're looking at your setup, okay, mm -hmm. um, I know that you're you're using that to help you with your painting so you can see the the light relationship of the shadows. Mm -hmm. Do you find that 
you kind of go off on your own to make it look round, um, you know, especially in a studio setting like this where we have the extra lights. Yeah, you're um, saying, do I push it a little bit more than I see it? Yes. I do. You do. I do. Okay. You know, because at the end of the day, um, you know, once this uh, painting is viewed without that in front of me, mm -hmm. this painting has to work. And, and the question is, am I going for a three-dimensional feel? And, and do I have that three-dimensional feel in the painting when that's not around? And if it doesn't feel it, I will obviously try to push it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but that, again, I think it's objective. You, you can choose not to. You can, you know, throw your brushes down. And uh, when the model's done posing, you're done. Mm -hmm. And then you're just kind of in the experience. I want to make sure that the painting is its own thing and it functions mm -hmm. uh, as its own thing. Well, we just have a couple more minutes left in the show. Mm -hmm. So um, is there anything in conclusion that, that you would like to say? Yeah, if you uh, master the sphere, it sounds like the most uh, fundamental thing, maybe too easy, but uh, these are just really where everything is. Every object that we see is a, a version of a sphere. Uh, you can really break it down into a sphere, a cone, a cube, um, a sphere, a cone, cube or cylinder. Mm -hmm. And that's really what everything is. So you beginners know, really should start, your opinion would be, uh, to start with? Maybe, yeah, maybe some fruit. They're always fruit? nice and round and they're spheres, um, mm -hmm. you know. Or even like you did, a, uh, a bowl or painted yeah. styrofoam. Sphere. Yeah. Spheres are always a great place to start. In, in any color, really. Yeah, just like if you were to learn how to play, um, you know, guitar, you'd probably learn the instrument before you, everyone wants to play mm -hmm. Stairway to Heaven, but right. you'd have to learn how to, you know, hold the guitar, there, there's mastery at every, every level, mm -hmm. how to use your brushes, how to lay out your paints, how to work on the surface, every surface mm -hmm. is different, there's a ton of tangibles when it comes to uh, uh, painting, and they're all difficult. This looks, it looks fantastic. I, I'll leave you with this, uh, a, a, an artist uh, once said that uh, painting is like falling down the stairs and it's uh, landing on your feet. So it's extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, just focus and uh, start with the, the fundamentals. And if you can master this, you can slowly work your way into mm -hmm. to much more complex things. And focusing is not always easy, but... Patience. Patience. I actually Patience put it on my syllabus. Focus. I'm going to say that to my, to my <laughs> followers and my audience. Patience and focus. So um, I'd like to thank um, Master Casey for coming on my show. Remember, this is part two. Um, take a look at the first part. All right. If you uh, if you tune into part two first, go back look at part one and uh, feel free to to contact us. Uh, Todd's information will be at the end of the show and take a peek at the Deco Art products that were used today. I'd like to thank Deco Art for for sending Todd the products um, to try out and uh, which, um, you know, alternatively have uh, turned him into coming on our show. So thank you again for tuning in. Thank you again. It's been wonderful having you. Thanks for having me.